guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is the daily show where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is Dennis Sen. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of Collider Movie Talk. As you can see, I'm back from Japan. I'm also on a big sugar high because our special guest brought in donuts. Surprisingly, it was not Sinead that brought in the donuts today. <laughs> Yes, he's my hero. Also here is John Roca. Hey guys, welcome. Yeah, that's a bronze medal. Hello, bucket <laughs> list. Uh, so happy to be here on a Friday. So happy to be here with our special guest. And great to be, thanks, to have, thanks for coming back. Yeah. I was worried about you. Yeah, you saw those pictures on my, my Instagram. We're like, you were like, you had a great time. Like, you did not want to come back. You've probably never seen me that relaxed before, right? I was like, who's that Dennis yeah. saying? I thought the outlaw was another personality. That's another personality. And I'm happy, obviously very happy to be here with Roth too. Also here is Ross Cornette. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> you sound so happy to be here, Dennis. I'm very happy to be here. This is an amazing crew with an amazing special guest. Yeah. And Roka might be wearing bronze, but I'm rocking the gold medal. Yeah. Oh, Thanks to our special burn. guest. He's back. It's Cody Miller. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me again. I had to bribe these guys with donuts to let me back on the show, but <laughs> it worked. I'm here. I'm happy to be here, so I'm excited. Thanks, yeah. guys. And we're here to talk about some movie news. And before we get started with the whatever is on the sidebar over here, two things dropped. The first one, uh, Sinead, can you tell us what it is? Zack Snyder's Justice League has been wrapping individual character shooting schedules over the last few weeks. And now the UK production has officially wrapped. Snyder took to social media to celebrate the occasion by sharing an incredible behind the scenes look at the production. Dennis, what did you think of the behind the scenes video for Justice League? Uh, I, I really enjoyed the video. It just kind of showed a lot of the... It, it shows the people who normally don't know what go, what's involved in a movie. Like, it's not just the, the main actors that you see and just the directors. There's so much going on. Like, all those stunt actors, all the camera people, all the people behind the scenes. And it just showed that how much fun they were having on set. Uh, it also just kind of marks... Because remember, a few months ago... We didn't even know if Zack Snyder was going to direct this movie. Mm -hmm. Like, just because of what was happening with Batman v Superman, how it wasn't being as well received as they were expecting, didn't do as well at the, as the box office, and they were starting to film, like, I think maybe one month after Batman v Superman opened, and there was a lot of speculation that that uh, Zack Snyder may not be directing this film. But now we, we're here at the point where it's obviously they kept him. We, we see, uh, uh, from everything we've seen so far from Comic-Con, from these things, from these videos, it looks like things are going well. And I, I think this is a, a good sign. Roka? Yeah, I, I think this accomplished what, they're, what they've been so fervently trying to accomplish since Batman vs. Superman came out, which is, it's gonna be fun. We're all having fun. This is gonna be fun. And that's what it really radiated as you were watching this minute long thing. They're trying to get people to, people who are a little trepidatious, even after Suicide Squad, to come back to the DC uh, family, come back to DC property. And so this was a, a kind of nice way to do it. You had a lot of pretty people just running around being smiling <laughs> and happy. So, I mean, it was cool to see that. And you're right, Dennis, you got to see a lot of behind the scenes stuff. What really goes into creating these movies and how much effort, how much crew is involved. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so there's that. Uh, there's, apparently, Adam does not agree with what I'm saying, so <laughs> and he voiced it there. But yeah, it just seems in, it just seems like a smart move by them to do this, at least to kind of lean into it a little bit more about like, hey, we're gonna have fun. This is gonna be a great film, but you still have the the bat beard. So, oh, God. Roth, what do you <laughs> Roth, what do you think about Justice League wrapping, filming, and and the video itself? Um, I have no prejudice against the beard. No, you like <laughs> I love the bat beard. I think it's awesome. I know, you know, but hey. Um, I, I thought it looked great. I'd have to just echo what you guys were saying. It's obviously a vote of confidence on the part of the studio. They want to keep fans excited. They want to keep them engaged. They want to give them a taste of what this is like. And it is a treat to get that behind the scenes mm -hmm. look, right? And to see what they are, the tone of the set is like. And I think they are definitely sending that message. Look, guys, we're going to deliver you a movie that you're going to enjoy. They're enjoying making it. Let's all get ready to have a good time with this. Mm -hmm. and, and Cody, I know you thought uh, Man of Steel was, was a phenomenal film film Love and I, I i don't know your opinion on batman v yeah. superman yet i left bvs's theater uh very upset okay mm. i w wasn't a big fan um and going back and watching the ultimate cut um i enjoyed it much much more and have come to respect the the really brilliant things about the film um and so you know i'm, I'm in a much better place with that i just i think honestly like for a lot of people my expectations were just so 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 high because those trailers were so good um and you know and and as far as the clip goes the, my biggest takeaway is number one 
Aquaman is awesome. Perception changed. Like me being a swimmer, like Aquaman, like I love, <laughs> love, love Aquaman. Aquaman New 52 is amazing, one of my favorites. And um, Jason Momoa looks like he is so much fun to hang out with. Like <laughs> watching him like joke around and like throwing the trident and then grabbing yeah. Wonder Woman's sword and like playing with it. I was like, yeah, like I want to hang out with that dude. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks like they're having fun. And then also, as you said, Dennis, all the people that go into making that movie, like there's a, there's a shot at the very end where you see all of them like waving to the yeah. crowd. And there are so many people that deserve credit for just all the amazing work they put in. So. Yeah. Shane, what do you think about this? Um, I think it's exciting. I mean, I'm really just ready for the entire DC slate. Like, I'm just like so ready for next year to come. And Justice League looks great, so I'm I'm ready. Okay. All right. What's uh, the next topic? As Lionsgate prepares to bring Power Rangers to New York Comic Con, some brand new posters have dropped, and they reveal more than just powerful poses. We also get a great new look at the costumes and the Rangers' power coins as well. Cody, what did you think of the new posters for Power Rangers? <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm kind of the Power Ranger generation. Like I grew mm. up as a very young kid playing with Power Ranger toys um, and watching Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. And I love the first off, I love these posters. I think they're I think it's the best piece of marketing that that studio has put out for this film yet. They look cool. Like they just they look really really cool. Yeah. Um, and it makes me more excited to see the movie. I do think it's kind of funny that it does say go go like right next to them. <laughs> like are we really going like it's it, I don't we don't really know how much of an adult vibe we're gonna get from this film yet. But the whole go go thing I don't know. It, it makes me think about the Mighty Morphin movie from the '90s mm -hmm. with you know Zordon <laughs> like Ivan Ooze. Like are we gonna get Ivan Ooze? That would be amazing. <laughs> All right. Any, anyway, uh, Ross. What, what do you think about these posters? I don't have to agree. I, I actually liked the other posters as well. Um, I think it's a good marketing campaign, and I think that they've been doing a lot to kind of deliver the message about this movie. But I am curious, to your point, is this going to be a mix of the Power Rangers that we knew from the series yeah. Yeah. and that fan film that went totally dark? Mm, Are they yeah, going to try right. and find the hybrid between those two things, do you think? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure, but for me, yeah, I enjoyed these posters. I, I did not grow up in the Power Rangers generation. I was more of a Voltron Transformers age, but I've liked what I've seen so far. And, and during the pre-production meeting, like someone mentioned th these other posters, which I missed because I was gone, which was, I guess, their characters on Zords. I guess Zords are the giant robots that they pilot. Mm. I, I, I don't know. I don't watch the <laughs> yeah. show. Yeah. It just kind of reminded me of Pacific Rim. So yeah. that, that scored some points That's with me. And, and I'm sure it did not with N Roku. Yeah. <laughs> not if it's Pacific Rim related. It yeah, wouldn't yeah. know. This, no, these you you need peeing robots and, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah rather than, hey, we're doing ellipticals <laughs> to move our robots. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, no, I love these posters are fantastic. I, I like you, Dennis. I didn't grow up in the Power Rangers uh, generation. I know people were into it. I had friends who were into it, but like it wasn't my jam. But this is pulling me into the movie. And I'm not the person they necessarily want to go to. They want to go for the younger demographic. But if they're pulling me in as well, that's a good thing too for the studio because this kind of stuff, it's just it got that it's got the speed thing. So it reminds you of the flash mm. and also has a little bit of an anime vibe to it, mm. which which is kind of a, a real subtle call out to its heritage. And all the I don't mind the go go. I think it's a good way to lean into it. Be like we're, we're taking we're not taking ourselves too seriously and we're gonna find our way to walk the line. It'll be fun and interesting and playful, but still be a little harder edge than what we've seen yeah, before. Yeah, re real quick, I mean, like, obviously, there's a lot of nostalgia for someone like me and, like, people of my generation, but um, it's gonna be interesting to see, like, how many people with that nostalgia, like, go out and support this movie. I right. mean, obviously, the marketing's gonna, you know, be the determining factor of that. Because, like, okay, a movie like The Sandlot, which we all love for nostalgic reasons, can go back and rewatch The Sandlot. Um, but I cannot go back and rewatch <laughs> Money Wolf and Power Rangers. Like, I've tried, and I just can't watch yeah. it, so. Uh, I, I have the same thing with Transformers. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love Transformers, the 1985 animated movie, and I can rewatch that. But the, as far as the uh, actual series, oh. cartoon series, <laughs> I can't watch. Yeah, yeah. You know, I it's know people who buy like the Blu-rays of the the three seasons. Like, yeah. you watch yeah. them, you're like, every episode is kind of the the same thing that happens yeah. over and over. Again. It's a grind yeah. to get through. Yeah. <laughs> it's formula. But that movie, just just to follow up on that, if you guys haven't seen that Transformers movie, oh, it good is one. so <laughs> the good. The good one. It's so great. With Orson Welles it, yes. as Unicron. <laughs> It's insane, but then it goes to these really dark places yeah. with kind of like deep messages. Yeah. <laughs> out of nowhere. Cybertron. Well, we were still young as a country trying to figure out yeah. what okay. our ideas were. And there's plenty of good Transformers movies. Don't let Dennis tell me otherwise. <laughs> All the pe peen robots. All right. Stop it. Okay. All right. What's next? <laughs> we just found out that the upcoming Wolverine 3 movie is titled Logan, with the film reporting to be about an older Logan with degenerating abilities. But that's not the only aging hero in the movie. James Mangold has recently revealed a brand new behind the scenes image featuring an older, more haggard Patrick Stewart as Charles Xavier slash Professor X. And though plot details do 
shed some light on Professor X. We don't know exactly how he'll fit into the movie with Logan. We'll find out more when it debuts in theaters on March 3rd, 2017. Dennis, thoughts on the new image of Professor X from Logan? I think it looks great. We talked about the story details yesterday about a diminished Wolverine and his powers and also Professor X that may have Alzheimer's or something's wrong. His powers are unstable. And I really like this picture, one, because the effects on there, which I assume are digital effects, because now with uh, with the aging makeup, I know uh, with makeup artists, they say that the aging style is is kind of the hardest thing to pull off. And now they've kind of moved to the digital. Like you see uh, Peggy Carter in, in the Captain America yeah, movies. Yeah. They look fantastic. And I think that's what's going on here. That looks great. And then two, just the look on his face. He's portraying a person who isn't quite Mm-hmm. all there and I think that's part of the storyline Cody what do you think yeah I didn't notice until now until it was blown up it looks like one of his eyes is like a little bit more white than the other I don't know if that has anything to do with anything but he looks angry like he kind of looks he, like he looks like I'm sensing a little bit of disgust anyway I think it's a sweet picture um, I mean he looks like he's coming out of the Mad Max world in my opinion mm-hmm. and that's just a good thing for me Roth um, anytime you say Mad Max, I perk up. Right? So I'm so <laughs> right there on Cody's pitch, 100%. Um, yeah, you know what? I love the idea of seeing these heroes vulnerable. And we do to some degree, but I don't think they've ever allowed them to be vulnerable in a real human way. I am one of those defenders of Superman 2. Mm-hmm. Don't judge me. Um, because I think that's an interesting thing to explore. If you can really do that in a rich way here. And I mean, if he has Alzheimer's, imagine with that ability, what that would do to the world, right? Mm-hmm. And then if on top of it, Logan. That's actually a really scary um, thought. Right? Yeah, uh, yeah I didn't yeah. think about that. It, so imagine how dangerous that is for the world and for him. And then you're in the position of, do I have to put down my friend and mentor? Yeah. Right? Oh. To, like that's pretty deep stuff for him. And then if he's diminished on top of it, how do you even accomplish that if you have to do it? So I feel like this could be an incredible, one of the best X-Men movies that we've seen potentially. It's at least something different. You yeah. Know? It yeah. being rated R, being set in a dystopian future. Roka, what do you think? I think you make a lot of great points, Roth. I mean, this whole idea of what we have to understand, the best superhero movies are the ones you gravitate to from a human level. The powers almost seem irrelevant. It's about who they are as people, right? Man, I'm a huge Man of Steel fan, too, because the reboot worked at making him more, there's more to explore about what it's like to grow up as an outsider in this country, as an outsider in this world. Mm -hmm. And so I loved what they did with Man of Steel. And so you get this idea, and Wolverine deserves a good, damn movie and he hasn't had one yeah. from beginning to end the last one was good up until the last 20 or 30 minutes yeah. you want a good mm-hmm. whole movie and he deserves it. I love the fact that they're calling it Logan because mm-hmm. that means it's not about Wolverine it's about Character. Logan the yeah. human okay. the human the exactly human. that's what they're exploring yeah. and so what you have here with Professor X this has always been the best relationship in all the X-Men films it has been Professor X and Wolverine it has mm-hmm. not been Wolverine and and Famke Jansen or I'm, I'm sorry uh, Jean Grey it's not been that even though that those were great relationships with, Scott, with uh, Cyclops great, tr- great uh, triangle but this this has been the relationship and these are two fantastic actors so if you're gonna go old man logan you're gonna go like in another time in the future you know all this stuff going on possibly x23 you want to have your two strongest actors step forward from the property mm-hmm. and from the franchise and work together because that's going to keep us watching it and if you're going to be dark and dirty patrick stewart and hugh jackman can pull that off and oh. this looks like it's good yeah. oh sorry also no. i don't i i know people didn't love that title but do you guys agree like this shows a pretty big vote of confidence on the part of the I studio the just to to yep. not even include x-men or wolverine yep. in the title i feel like that tells me that they think they've got something really good yeah that's yeah. like even with like the batman films you know eventually it became the dark knight and the dark knight rises and people yeah. forget that we know because we're fans right. that the dark knight is synonymous with batman mm-hmm. the general audience right. doesn't know that mm-hmm. but it, batman is such a big character that mm-hmm. it, and i think wolverine has started you know in mm-hmm. that kind of status yeah. All right, uh, now we're moving on to buy or sell. Uh, Shanae, what do we got first? Yesterday, a new set of images and poster were released from Luc Besson's Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. The movie stars Dane DeHaan and Cara Delevingne as special operatives for the government of the human territories charged with maintaining order throughout the universe. Valerian and, and the City of a Thousand Planets opens in theaters on July 21st, 2017. Roth, do you buy or sell the new images and poster for Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets? I totally buy it. Not Mm. only do I like the images, but everything that I heard out of Comic-Con with the people that saw the preview footage was positive. People were blown away by this. This stole the con for so many people. So that gives me a huge vote of confidence. Also, I am an unabashed lover of the fifth element. Don't Mm -hmm. care. 
I love it. I've seen that movie so many times. It's one of those films that I could watch over and over and over again and still enjoy myself with it. I feel like this is that Luc Besson that's really fun, you know, and imaginative and larger than life, but also maybe with a little bit more depth and scale to it mm -hmm. from what I'm hearing. Uh, Roca? Yeah, I like the images too. Um, I'm not familiar with the source material. You know, it's an extensive, like there's vo volumes of this written. So there's a lot to explore for him. But I'm a massive fan when Luc Besson gets it right. Mm -hmm. I like, I'm one of the few people that defends Lucy to this day because I really enjoy it. That's a great trip of a movie. That's another one where... Yeah, yeah I know. Uh, I, mean, yeah. I, I absolutely, absolutely well. loved it. Oh, I did. Man. From I, beginning to end, it's I, so I much fun. I actually like the beginning. The ending is yeah. just so bad. The first bad. half right. I loved, but right. then... Mm. Okay. Well, I didn't love Lucy, but it's like opening up his brain yeah. and then and just allowing it to pour out on screen, which is yeah. interesting in its own way. And I like these... My only concern, of course, coming out of Suicide Squad is Cara Delevingne. That's my concern. And it's like, is she going to be able to do good work here? We didn't, like a lot of people did not like her coming out of Suicide Squad. So we'll see if that's a director thing or if that's an acting thing. Paper Towns, I thought she was okay, but she wasn't in it long enough. She always looks so kind of upset. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah that's, <laughs> she's a model. That's their job. Like, I liked, I like those movies, but yeah. it's just. Yeah. Well, yeah, with Suicide Squad, it's a little tough, man. Well, yeah, I mean, when you're doing this, you're doing this. this. <laughs> not exactly but this, this intimidating. Looks, but this looks inventive and it looks smart and it looks like it would be interesting to at least see the, the production design of the movie. Who knows if the movie will be good because yeah. Luc Besson is always hit or yeah. miss. Mm -hmm. But the production design, it looks fantastic. Cody, are you a big uh, Luc Besson fan? I, well, yes, but I don't know anything about this source material. Mm -hmm. And um, those like duck people things are <laughs> cracking me up. <laughs> <laughs> but I dig it. Like, I want to yeah. see it. I'm all about weird stuff like that. Like, where's Schnepp when we need him? Yeah. Um, and the, the one poster that Probably shows, in there. Yeah, <laughs> probably in there. Yeah. Um, the, I mean, the main one with the ship and with them standing on the planet and you see the galaxy, like, that just, yeah. that's like sci fi awesomeness that I want to see um, and also the title like the title is really bold like mm -hmm. the city of a thousand planets like that's all like that like that intrigues me just as is you know like one of the biggest mistakes I think they made with with um, uh, John Carter was not calling it John Carter of Mars like right yeah. there people of Mars oh that's awesome and, and that's besides the point I want to see this movie let's yeah. do it yeah I, I, I like these images that I don't know about the duck ones they, kinda, they <laughs> creep me out they just creep me out it's they a little like doctor who it looks like Howard the Duck too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good thing. It um, looks like Doctor Who. But but the poster, I, I do think this is the Luke Besson that you know. I I kind of agree with Roca where he is hit hit or miss. Mm -hmm. I for me Lucy was a miss. Uh, but you know stuff like Fifth Element, The yeah. Professional, mm -hmm. those things, and I think like this is something he's very passionate about. And from like you, I heard from Comic Con that everyone loved the footage. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm really looking forward to this. Do you think that, two questions, do you think it could be a combination of the professional and the fifth element and how amazing is that? Two, city oh. of a thousand planets. Do we think it's a thousand pugs from Men in Black with little planets on their collars? No, <laughs> just me. I don't know. I, I try to erase, <laughs> after Men in Black, the first Men in Black, I try to erase <laughs> oh the, rest of, the rest of the movies. MIB3 is good. They were oh, there were Dennis, I don't understand. All right. Um, <laughs> this, feels, this feels like a new show. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's, let's move on. What What's were you next? thinking with Dennis and John? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> According to Variety, Disney is in talks with Hairspray director Adam Shankman to helm Disenchanted, the sequel to the Amy Adams 2007 comedy fantasy Enchanted. The sequel has been a development for several years now, with Adams saying earlier this year that she hopes to be involved. The story is set 10 years after Enchanted, with Adams character Giselle questioning her happily ever after and accidentally triggering events that make everyone's lives turn upside down in both the real world and in the animated kingdom of Andalasia. Roca, do you buy or sell Adam Shankman directing an enchanted sequel? God, I, this is a tough one because he has as many, like Besson, he has as many kind of hits as he has really bad movies. So I would say I'm selling it for right now. I don't know if this is the right person to do it because I loved Enchanted. I have no shame saying how much I enjoyed that movie. Amy Adams is absolutely adorable and precious in that film. And Patrick Dempsey, it's one of those rare forays in a feature film where he actually holds his own with who he's with. And so it's a fun film to watch, really enjoyable. And the music is really uh, well done too. And it's inventive with what it's making fun of. So how are you going to do a, I don't know if you hand it to the guy who did The Pacifier, which almost destroyed Vin Diesel's career. <laughs> Cheaper by the dozen too. Bedtime Stories, which is one of the worst Adam Sandler films ever made and Rock of Ages which almost buried Tom Cruise as well so but he did do Hairspray which people love he did do A Walk to Remember which is an awesomely small film that I enjoyed and Bringing Down the House is a fun fun little throwaway film that, that kind of 
popped up in the middle with the Disney type stuff in the two, I think late 90s, early 2000s. It was a fun thing to watch with Queen Latifah. So I don't know. I, to me, I'm selling it now because I just don't know if I have enough faith in him because he has so many more misses than hits. Mm. Roth? I have to agree. Basically, you captured it right there. Yeah. You know, this is a movie that I also unabashedly adore, and she's amazing in yeah. that film. It's so sweet and it's so funny. Um, and it came out at a time, too, when people I don't think were taking that approach, so it felt really fresh. Yeah. And now we see a lot more of this kind of thing. And so I, I don't know how you update it, but if Amy Adams is on board, I don't think she's taking on projects that she doesn't totally believe in, particularly like this. Yeah. Um, so I have to imagine it's at least a good script. Yeah. Cody, are you looking forward to I the am, sequel? I am, yeah. I mean, the, the first movie was one that I, I mean, I'm not the, t the target audience for that type of movie, um, and I didn't really have a whole lot of interest in seeing it, but I, I watched with my younger sister, and I loved it, and uh, I, I thought it was wonderful, and Amy Adams was great. I mean, it's also, I mean, the type of movie, it says it's taking place 10 years later, and so I think they can easily sum up you know why she is the way she mm -hmm. is and what's going on in, in this in the story um, and then move forward um, so in terms of like you know the audience any disconnect you know has it been too much time I don't think so um, and as far as the director goes I think I mean like you said it, it, it's hit or miss but mm -hmm. I'm gonna buy it because I think that this is something that could be in his wheelhouse and could be really really good I mean like you guys I was pleasantly surprised by Enchanted mm -hmm. I, I wasn't going in expecting much but I actually was very entertained and, and a sequel to me, I don't know if it was necessary, but uh, I'm definitely interested in checking it out. And also the storyline they're trying to portray, which is something a little more realistic, where it's like, okay, it isn't that fantasy, you know, romance isn't just, you know, you fall in love and then you live happily ever after. There's, you know, th things in relations to that. Come, I'm surprised. Dis I don't know how far Disney is going to go with that. But as far as the director, I'm going to actually have to sell it. I mean, I didn't see a lot of his movies, but like some of them, like uh, The Wedding Planner, oh. and a, you know, like A Walk to Remember, I haven't seen, but I remember watching like it's maybe so like, like, yeah. mm, it's so sad. Like, it's good. like oh two my minutes God. of it, I, just, no. I, I couldn't watch it anymore. Yeah. Um, Mandy Moore, right? Rock, yeah. And Rock of Ages, yeah, just, oh. just it didn't work for me. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna sell for now. Sinead, uh, are you looking forward to this movie? I mean, I don't really know if I, if I was, like begging for an enchanted sequel to begin with. <laughs> and the, one of the reasons that I think it did so well is because it was, like Roth said, it was fresh at that time and it was kind of a, it was an original concept where yeah. now it doesn't seem that original. But at the same time, like Hairspray is one of my favorite musical yes. movies. I absolutely adore that movie. Yeah. And I would watch that movie over Enchanted any day. I liked Enchanted, but I absolutely love Hairspray and I feel like he kind of shines in this kind of genre, maybe besides Rock of Ages, but this kind of very playful, family-friendly musical. So that gives me a little bit of hope. So I would have to buy it. Man, I'm feeling some some hate for Rock of Ages. I really like that oh, movie. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. I mean, it's not an Oscar contender. It wasn't, but Listen, I enjoyed it. Yeah, it's all, not terrible. We all, have, <laughs> we all have blind spots, Cody. We all have blind spots. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I, I was expecting more out of Rock of Ages, especially given how good the songs yeah. themselves the are. The stage play is fantastic. And uh -huh. just, I just, I was bored yeah. watching the movie, know. you know, and none of the, the, the perform musical performances to me really it was nailed cast. it, you know? And the uh, casting, yeah. All right, what's next? Two new teasers have been released for John Wick Chapter 2 and War for the Planet of the Apes. War's snowy teaser is set to a voiceover from Andy Serkis' Caesar saying his farewell to Malcolm, played by Jason Clark, at the end of Dawn, while John Wick picks up with Keanu Reeves in Rome getting fitted for a new suit and heavy firepower. Both movies will share all new footage at this weekend's New York Comic Con. War for the Planet of the Apes opens July 14, 2017, and John Wick Chapter 2 opens on February 10, 2017. Cody, do you buy or sell the new teasers for John Wick 2? Two and War for the Planet of the Apes. Yeah, um, I actually I buy both of these with like the change in my pocket. I don't love either <laughs> of these. Like I'm not, I'm not putting down a lot of money on this, but um, I, I I like them enough to to give them a buy. And um, you know the the Apes one. Just hearing Andy Serkis's voice as Caesar saying "War is here," I was like, "Yes!" Like <laughs> finally, they didn't give us really anything, but like that, it's like it's a teaser to the trailer. Like it's they're not really giving us much, so like it excited me. It worked. They got me. They've got my money. Um, and the John Wick one, like the same thing. Like if it was any other movie, I would have sold this. Mm -hmm. But because I've seen the first John Wick, and I think anybody else who has seen the first John Wick and sees him cocking his gun, we're like, "Let's do this. Want to mm -hmm. see this again?" So, Roth, are you buying these teaser trailers? Hell yes. <laughs> yes. Are you, am I allowed to say that here? Yes. I don't know. Good. Because hell yes. I am so on board with that yeah. Apes franchise. Yes. It is so good. And they have earned this moment, right? They have built up with Caesar. We know how hard this is for Caesar. Mm. It's amazing. This is, yes. 
All I needed was that image. All right. I needed was that voice. Yeah. Um, as far as John Wick is concerned, man, I love that movie. That is such an original way to do an action film. It's got great action. It has in- incredible characters, and it creates this whole world. Like, get me back in that hotel mm. right freaking mm. now. And also, that's about as many people that need to die when you kill a puppy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, Cody, make a great point where where I think these teaser trailers work because the, the movies that preceded them were, were well done and well received, and so they were able to build that. Because you couldn't release these two teaser trailers. Let's say these were movies that were uh, the first of the franchise that people mm. didn't know. You, you're not getting people excited, but because with like War of the Planet of the Apes, you know what happened with Dawn, you know what happened with Rise, so that imagery and that voice is much more effective. And then yes. John Wick too. I kind of got almost more of a James Bond, uh, Kingsman vibe mm. to it, just because he's in Europe, he's getting, you know, yeah. his suit on and <laughs> and it, the trailer drops on Saturday which is tomorrow which is unfortunate for us so we can't see the whole thing and talk about it right. Roka yeah I'm, I'm gonna split here so do I have to buy or sell like completely no you can buy or sell okay. the individual I buy one. the wick I kind of okay. sell the Planet of the okay. Apes one well, and I'm a massive fan of both properties I guess we can say the properties now they're sequels uh, to me I'm, I'm I love John Wick I echo what everybody said out of the blue Weinstein tried to bury it we wouldn't let him bury it a lot of us came to see it, and now we have a sequel. And so I think that teaser trailer was fantastic. Put you back in the vibe. It's it's him re-embracing being a hitman again, you know, because of what happened before in the movie. You know, his wife's gone, the puppy's gone. He's got he's got a new dog. He's got a and it's a dog that mirrors his new coming back into being a ferocious animal. And so you're seeing that there. And so that whole coolness of it's very Kingsman. You're right. Mm-hmm. It's very cool. Getting the suit measure, very Bond esque, which is great. Puts you back in that vibe that you're gonna be in good hands with him, and you're gonna have a good time. The Planet of the Apes thing bothered me a little bit because I'm like, what does the snow mean? Is, is he, are we going to be on a snow planet? What are we doing here? Like, I don't <laughs> understand. Why are you using dialogue from the previous film? Give me something new. There's a one new line. There's one new line in the trailer or the teaser, which is which is cool. But like, I want to see something more, and I don't want to see him blown away because he's such a central part. I mean, it's, they're kind of giving you the idea that he might be killed off, Can and I'm imagine? like, ah. We, it, so I, why show me that already? Why show me that already? I was just about to say, like, we got to talk about this. We have an opportunity here. (laughs) It's called movie talk. The apes, like, this apes trilogy, if it is great, Mm -hmm. could be one of the all-time great trilogies. Mm -hmm. You know, it could go down with, like, Lord of the Rings. You know, with the original, the the first three Jason Bourne movies, in my opinion. Like, great, great trilogies. I just hope this movie is so, so good. Yeah, and it'd be kind of like the Jason Bourne trilogy where you had one director direct the first Mm, movie and then the, the one that did the second one did the last two and then... But they, they kind of work, it. yeah, and they nailed all work it. together still. So uh, you make a great point. All right, what's next? According to the rap, Emily Mortimer has joined the cast of Mary Poppins Returns as the grown-up Jane Banks. She will star alongside Ben Wishaw as her brother, Michael Banks, Emily Blunt as the ageless magical nanny, as well as Lynn Manuel Miranda and Meryl Streep. Mary Poppins Returns is set in Depression-era London, 20 years after the events of the original 1964 movie. Jane and Michael are now adults, and Michael has three kids of his own. When tragedy strikes. The family Mary Poppins arrives to help them rediscover the joy and adventure missing from their lives. Mary Poppins Returns is scheduled to open December 25th, 2018. Dennis, do you buy or, do you buy or sell the addition of Emily Mortimer to Mary Poppins Returns? Uh, I'm going to buy it. I'm a fan of Emily Mortimer, especially I had a crush on her character in Newsroom. Mm. Uh, she, she did great work in Trans-Siberian and in uh, Shutter Island. It was a small part. And she's been known to do some comedy as well. She did a, a HBO series called Doll and M where it was kind of a curb your enthusiasm like where she played herself and that her best friend was was her assistant she also appeared in 30 Rock so I feel like she's a a good fit into into this uh, sequel Uh, what do you think Roth? Yeah, I think she is. I'm, I'm a huge fan as well, and I think she's a great fit. I do wonder, I mean, I'm optimistic about the sequel. I do think it's a lot to take on because mm-hmm. unlike Roko, we were talking a little bit before, yeah. I love Mary Poppins. Yeah. I think it's one of the, our great classics. It's so joyful. It's so whimsical, um, and it's kind of so perfectly what it needs to be despite the author hated it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, that I That I kind of feel a little nervous going into a sequel. Roka? Yeah, this is interesting. I mean, uh, uh, well, how can I say? Mary Poppins, yes, I, I think it's I, I think it's an enjoyable movie. Mm-hmm. But 
It's not. I'm not the biggest fan of the movie because the Dick Van Dyke stuff is so incredibly out of pace, out of place for what you're trying to do. And it wasn't like people didn't know how to do Cockney accents back then. So I mean, <laughs> it's just something about it. It's like it's like Mickey Rooney and, and Breakfast at Tiffany's. Oh, it's not that, that kills bad. Me. That kills the movie. It's yeah. not it's that bad. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'm going too far. Either way, <laughs> it just bothers me about the movie, you know. And so, uh, uh, what I but I I think this is if you're going to do this, you've got to expand the world, right? If you're going to come back this far, this this many years later, you got to expand the world. I guess they're setting it in the 80s, I would imagine, right? Is what it seems like from the timeline. Mm -mm. So, right? Is that right? No. No, no they're really? setting it in Depression Era okay. London, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Okay, Depression yeah. Era London. Okay, so and Emily Mortimer, the question is, do I buy it? I absolutely buy it. I think Emily, Emily's a fantastic actress. We see her pop up in a number of projects through the years, both film and TV, and enjoy her work. She's had to, and she's one of these, like, these. she's one of these quietly powerful actresses that just works. Like, yeah. Yeah. No fanfare, yeah. no big deal. Yeah. No one's given her awards, but she is consistent. She's good, and she's solid every single time. And in Match Point, she's great in Match Point, uh. right? I'm devastating yeah. as the wild. Like it's devastating, and and so she can bring that kind of power to her work. And Dolan M. Quietly, one of the most subversive film shows I've ever watched that nobody else watched, and it was so much fun to enjoy watching that film. They that didn't show, advertise rather. that show at all. They really yeah. didn't. You had to f go out and find that. I yeah. found it on HBO Go. It's such a weird little show, but such a f great one. Mm -hmm. But I think that they just didn't invest in it no. for some yeah. reason. Cody, what, oh yeah, I mean, it's think? a lot to tackle. I mean, it's it's a cherished movie and a cherished mm -hmm. franchise, no doubt. Um, I was on the phone with like Disney last week. I'm planning a Disney World trip, and as I was on hold, like they're playing the theme from the movie. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. Like and, and here comes the sequel. Um, and as far as Emily goes, I mean, she's amazing. I was a huge fan of the newsroom. Mm -hmm. I was so bummed when they canceled that show because I loved it. And like you said, like she's quiet and powerful and very underrated in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and she just works. She just she melted into that role and and in her other roles as well. You just you don't really point her out because she's that good. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Shanae, what are you looking forward to the Mary Poppins sequel? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I, I literally have yet to decide whether or not I'm super stoked on this or if I'm just like, why are we doing this? I, I think that I think it's going to be good. Like, I don't I don't have any doubts. that The movie is going to be awful. I don't think it's going to flop. I don't think it's going to bomb. I think it's going to be a huge success. But part of me just wants to be selfish and tell them not to touch it. Like, just leave it alone <laughs> the way it is. Like, that's from my childhood. Stop it. But at the same time, this is this is this is a good time to do something like this. I feel like enough time has passed. The cast is fantastic. Like anyone who says, oh man, why are they casting it this way? Is out of their minds because it's obviously got really great star power behind it. I just, I don't know. I don't know if it's just me being stubborn or <laughs> if, if there's something else to it that I don't like about the idea of making a sequel? I don't know. I can't put my finger on it. What what if they do Roca's version that's set in the eighties? Like, yeah, can you imagine, like, <laughs> like Mary, Mary, Mary Poppins come in with like frizzy hair and a yeah. jean jacket. That's been perfect. Yeah, I bet they get the Cockney accent right on that one. <laughs> All right, what's next? The Blade Runner sequel will be released in one year, and to mark the occasion, Warner Brothers has revealed that the film's official title is. Blade Runner 2049. Presumably, the 2049 refers to the year since the original Blade Runner took place in November 2019. Sicario and Arrival director Denis Villeneuve directs with Harrison Ford and Ryan Gosling both set to star. And the film hits theaters on October 5th, 2017. Roca, do you buy or sell the new title Blade Runner 2049? Absolutely. I think it might be, is it Blade Runner 2049 or is it Blade Runner 2049? Because in my mind, I was thinking 2049, so I accept it. So either way, I accept it however you want to say it, you know, because I think it's fantastic <laughs> where they're putting it. What? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I'm say Bronze medal. Bronze medal. <laughs> 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 Uh, I just like the way Blade because it reminds me of remember when Marvel did that like uh, Spider-Man 2099 yeah. like that, that's what my mind went to right so I, ex I I buy the title if it's 2049 I still buy the title you know so I'm just a massive fan of that because it doesn't give you like the replicants are back the replicants journey the replicants revenge there's none of that it just says 2049 which leaves it wide open oh, sorry which leaves it wide open to be whatever <laughs> it's going to be and so for me that makes me very very happy and I think it, it, immediately when I read the title I was like oh viscerally I had a feeling like oh I can't wait to see this mm -hmm. you know Roth you know I'm sold on this movie in total mm. right because I think he is actually the perfect director for a Blade Runner movie oh, yeah. because tonally he's mm. so aligned with what Blade Runner was and I love Blade Runner I know there's a lot of people now that are detractors and Ooh. say <laughs> <laughs> you tell me their names and addresses I will go find them that's ridiculous 
I'm not gonna <laughs> send you to that. Is it, is it Andy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not the Andy. I actually don't know. Yeah. Um, that'd be a fun movie fight. It's, so yeah, I, I'm 100% on board. I think he's the perfect director. I really think this is the perfect cast because I think that Harrison Ford is going to be so invested in this material and he's gonna want it to work. Uh, Ryan Gosling is so talented and this for me was the doorway into the idea of one of my favorite topics in media which is AI. Mm. And this an alien and aliens. Okay, you get it. <laughs> um, thank you Ridley Scott is what I'm trying to say. So. As much as I love the original, I am weirdly looking forward to the sequel, yeah. which normally isn't necessarily the case. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. Yeah, yeah super cool. Uh, is is Deacons doing this one? Yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay, yeah, it's gonna be, I mean, it's gonna him be beautiful. And, yeah. Yeah. Him and Villeneuve, like, yeah, they, they're, they're so good. Yeah. yeah, like like you said, I mean, the, the tone of Sicario and Prisoners just yeah. fits so well with that world, and I mean, nothing else said. Like, I mean, it, they have all the right ingredients to make a great movie. It's gonna be great, I think. Does Deacons get the Oscar? Oh. For this? Finally. For well, he's got mo other movies coming out before yeah, this, I'd right? Be surprised. Yeah. What's yeah. this? I mean, how many nominations have? 14. Like, it's like oh at least God. 12 or 13. Yeah. Right? I mean, every year it's just yeah. like you it's think he's going to win, but yeah. we got to do yeah. it. Sci-fi is a rarity to win an Oscar. That's yeah. true. Yeah. I mean, if it's not special, it, but effects. it's going to look I mean, I'm not a, a Blade Runner detractor. I just don't yeah. love it as much as other people who who like hardcore fans maybe like yourself. If Pacific Rim was on the television or Blade Runner, which would you watch? Depends on. I'm asking you a <laughs> question, Dennis. <laughs> it depends on my mood. If I want to be entertained, I, w I would watch, watch Pacific. That's Rim. a fair answer. Yeah, uh, but I am looking forward to this film because of the people <laughs> behind yeah. it. And I'll, I'll buy the title. It, it's simple. It, it lets you know that it is a sequel without just saying, "Oh, this is Blade Runner 2." I, I do feel like while this film is beloved amongst the the, the, the hardcore movie fans. Blade Runner isn't really that well known amongst the casual average movie going it's a bit audience. Of a cult film, like, yeah, yeah they hear Blade Runner 2, yeah. it's not yeah. like, oh yeah, we're dying for a sequel. So maybe this like Blade Runner 2049, maybe that will sell it to them more is like yeah. maybe they think it's a, an original f new film. I right. mean, I, I don't know how many people are actually going to go back and watch the original that haven't seen it already to get prepared for for this one. Well, I'm win. I'm happy to host any showings okay. for anybody <laughs> who hasn't seen them. I will rent theaters out. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, before we get on to Mailbag, uh, we have our weekly Friday segment, Box Office Predictions, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. This is where we try and predict what the top five movies this weekend are. Uh, Roka, what do you got? Uh, let's see. Uh, since I won last week, it's only right that I should go first <laughs> well, this yeah, week. Yeah, yeah, weren't you complaining about someone not yeah. bringing uh, tacos? tacos? Jason Inman, I need Doritos tacos. Yeah. I was, I miss, I said on this show, Miss Peregrine would be number one. All the other men, yeah. men, suppose they, they, <laughs> they, they said I was wrong. And what happened? I was right. Never doubt the power of family and films. And where are they now? Where are they now? <laughs> Look at me now. No, I mean, like, you never doubt the power of family films. Pe people will take their kids and drop their kids yes. off or like, just to get out of the house or get a break. They will do anything. And this film was kind of like X-Men light, yeah. you know, for kids. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't surprised. So I, um, uh, let's go this way. I think Girl on the Trends get a lot of buzz. I think that'll be number one. I think Miss Peregrine was going to stay strong at number two, even though the reviews haven't been that great for it. Deepwater Horizon, which is fantastic. I cannot recommend Deepwater Horizon enough. At number three, uh, Birth of a Nation, number four, I think all the bad press and the stuff going on with Nath Nathaniel Parker is going to affect the box office of this film. Normally, I would have put that number one, I thought, because of the buzz coming out of the film festivals. Uh, and then Storks at number five, which is, Storks is still hanging around. Mm -hmm. Roth? Uh, I'm going to go with Girl and Train at 29. I'm going to go with uh, Miss Peregrine's at 15. Are we doing numbers? No. no. You can. You can. Uh, you you're yeah. killing it. Yeah. Uh, sure. Go ahead. Um, I'm going to go with Deepwater Horizon at 10, 11. I'm going to go a little big on that. I think Storks, actually. Mm. Um, and then Birth of a Nation, because I think that the I, I think that the, the negative press is going to have a bigger impact than maybe we think. Mm. Cody? Yeah, I'm thinking that Girl on a Train is one, similar to you guys, um, then Peregrine. And then Deepwater Horizon, and then I mean, yeah, never underestimate the power of a family film. So Storks may not be the greatest movie. I still haven't seen it yet, mm -hmm. but I think that'll be four. And I'm gonna put Birth of a Nation at five. Uh -huh. Yeah, 
Yeah, I have Girl on uh, Girl the Train number one. I feel like I haven't seen it yet, but because it's giving that kind of Gone Girl vibe mm-hmm. out and people yeah. really enjoyed Gone Girl, including myself, and that did actually pretty well at the box office. Mm-hmm. So people are going to see that. Uh, number two, Miss Peregrine. I think there's going to be a lot of carryover audience. Uh, three, Deepwater Horizon. I, I still haven't seen, but I'm a fan of Peter Berg. Yeah. So um, four, I actually have Magnificent Seven. I, I feel like that's going to cool. hang in there. Wow. And Number five, I want to put Birth of the Nation. I feel like the controversy is going to just keep people away. So I'm going to put Storks there. Storks, mm. I think, uh, from the first to the second week, only dropped like 36%. Mm. So and it's a family it's film. Impressive. You know, parents are going to take their kids to see it. And, and so I think Birth of the Nation is really going to take a hit. And, yeah. and it's just not going to do yeah, very it well. It might not make it. It was, always, it was already going to be a tough sell to yes. a majority of the white uh, market here in in the country so to add this other stuff upon it it just gives them an excuse not to go and, it, I and mean, that's unfortunate and it's it's a i mean it's supposedly I, a very fantastic and, yeah of course obviously yeah. a difficult subject yeah. matter i mean hard to watch um yeah yeah, yeah. All right, uh, before we get on to mailbag, I want to remind you guys that tomorrow we have our mailbag shows and also best of the week. And then on Sunday, we have another mailbag show and then movie talk. We're back here on Monday. Also, if you didn't check out our X-Men Apocalypse commentary, that was me, Riley, Wendy, and John Campia. That's on the channel right now. Also, we're going to take your live Twitter questions after mailbag. You can tweet us at Collider Video. So, Sinead, what do we got first in mailbag? Michael writes, just watched Christopher Nolan's Memento and found the style to be very intriguing. How do you all feel about non-linear storytelling? Thanks for taking my question and keep up the good work. Uh, I think non-linear storytelling is good when it's used correctly. Uh, there's a lot of great films that have been done in that style. Uh, it, yeah, it's just it's just a storytelling device. And, mm-hmm. and if people, if the story fits what they're using it for, I, I think, you know, someone like Tarantino does non-linear storytelling mm-hmm. very well. He actually, when he did Pulp Fiction, he already did it with Reservoir Dogs, but, pe- you know, people don't watch that movie until after Pulp Fiction. Right. Mm-hmm. But when Pulp Fiction came out in the 90s, it influenced so many people. How many indie films came out after that that yeah. tried to kind of ape mm-hmm. and imitate a Tarantino style? And mm-hmm. one of the things they imitated was that non-linear style. Mm-hmm. What do you think, Ra? I, I would have to agree with you. I would say that Memento is the perfect example of that. It still remains one of my favorite Christopher Nolan films because I remember when it came out, I was so just taken by it and I was immediately connected into the story and trying to figure out what was happening from this man. But the truth, like it had to be told that way mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. that was his experience mm-hmm. of life. Mm-hmm. You know, he was trying to track his own history and he couldn't do it. So it was the perfect way to tell that story. And then you're right, Tarantino is great at it. And I like it when it's well done because it just keeps me engaged as a viewer. But sometimes it falls back to the TV version of it. Not that there's not great television. There's amazing television. But like the trope of six hours earlier. You know, they show a scene and they're like six hours earlier, which sometimes can be fun. But it's not quite as elegantly done Mm -hmm. as Memento. Right. Cody? Totally agree. I mean, Memento is just an amazing film. Mm -hmm. Um, Other movies that stand out to me, like Deadpool. Yeah, you know, the way yeah. That's, that's like yeah. that's just a huge, huge hit. So it just totally um, uh, depends on the subject matter. Um, another one that I really love that stood out to me was you know the way that the social network was told. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it, it works, and when it's done well, it's awesome. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, Eternal Sunshine is the one you can yes. throw in there too. Totally. Eternal Sunshine totally. is so fantastic with that. So when the in the right hands, and, and really this was the only film that that director did that people enjoyed, I think since. And, and so in the right hands with the right director, uh, you can make nonlinear storytelling really work well. Um, I didn't think Science of Sleep worked out for him. Did it? Oh, you're yeah. talking. I, I thought you were Michelle talking Gondry. about. Yeah, Michelle. Yeah. I for a second thought you were talking about Christopher Nolan. No, 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 no,
example that Nolan is fantastic with that movie and you could argue it's probably his top two or three best film he's ever made you yeah. know it's so so powerful so good so believable and Carrie Ann Moss is fantastic in that as well bouncing off of Guy Pearce through the whole time yeah Usual Suspects is a good example yeah. mm-hmm. of yeah. Yeah. that's done well one that's not like bad but I just had no I didn't have any idea why they did it was Michael Clayton. Do you remember that movie? Oh, yeah. I like that movie, yeah. but they started off mm-hmm. with, with uh, I think, him burning the car, and, yeah. and they kind of mm-hmm. led up to it. And by the time they led up to it, I was like, that really wasn't the payoff you yeah, wanted. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I just felt like if they just told it straightforward, it, it would have been a lot better. Yeah. So that, mm-hmm. that's kind of a case where they tried it, but it didn't quite quite work. Yeah. yeah. Van- I thought Vanilla Sky, too, uh, for mm-hmm. what it was. For if you liked Vanilla did, Sky, that's what it was. I, I did like Vanilla Sky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And conceptually, that was. I think that with Eternal Sunshine, t- uh, I think that that was the marriage of the writer and the director, Charlie yes. Kaufman mm-hmm. and Michelle Gondry's style, were the perfect marriage. Yeah. And it's, it just goes to show how hard it is to make a great movie. And sometimes it's just this weird yeah. alchemy yeah. that you can't control. Because Science of Sleep, he, it was Michelle Gondry just being just Michelle Gondry. Yeah. And Michelle it was Gond- just like, what? <laughs> I, I didn't hate it, just wasn't, wasn't as good as Eternal. Yeah. I wasn't altered enough to enjoy that film yeah. when I saw it. Oh, okay. <laughs> you, guys, you, you guys can leave in the comments. Dennis and I have an ongoing debate for like the last seven years yes. about whether it's an optimistic ending or a pessimistic ending. Uh, of oh, what? Eternal Sunshine? Man. Yes. Oh, Eternal Sunshine? man. Yes. Yeah. Can, you, can you guess I, which one I am? <laughs> 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 what do you what do you think of the ending? I love this. I see this movie. Oh, all I love the, the film. Yeah. I love the film. So love it. To me, the ending is optimistic because they oh. understand the they understand that they have no choice but to do this because they love each other and there's okay. no other way out. Yeah. And there's no other way out. Okay. I am so torn right now. <laughs> I am, this is like this is tough. I'm gonna go slightly opt. I. Yeah, I'm gonna go slightly optimistic <laughs> just because love conquers all, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you, know? so you guys are all raw size. I'm a little more pessimistic. It, it probably didn't help that I watched that film after uh, like a, a seven year relationship. Yeah, don't do that. So at the don't end, I was that. like, this is yeah. a champion. Yeah. It's done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I watched that and I was like, it's yeah. such a heartbreaker, though. It, even, like, even though. But his, his, yeah. <laughs> that's the moment. That's yeah. the moment when you're like, okay, okay. there's possibility. Yes. Yeah. Because he understands. And she understands. And that you have a shorthand now walking into the relationship again yeah. that you can refer to when the fights happen, when the disagreements happen. Yeah. Honey, remember? Honey, remember? Yeah. Or hey, remember? Yeah. I just something. see the whole cycle going. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, they, yeah. maybe, just, yeah. maybe they just use that as their phrase for when things are getting too much. Yeah. They just go, I know. Yeah. You know, like life <laughs> yeah. is hard, relationships are hard. We're going to do it anyway, man. Yeah. All right, that's <laughs> it for a mailbag. Now, onto your live uh, Twitter questions. Wendy, what do you got picked out? Uh, I just totally lost my spot. There it is. Andrew Wallach says, here's the question. Do you think we'll ever get a new iconic horror villain along the lines of Michael Myers, Jason, Freddy, Chucky, and et cetera? Seems like we haven't had one of them since then. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm not the big horror guy, so I will leave that to you guys. I, I don't know. We haven't had like an iconic one since. I mean, mm. it's, it's... Jigsaw? Yeah, for some I, I people, would, I would say yeah. in a in a way, yeah. 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 I mean, he's not the one doing the the, the chaos. Mm-hmm. He's, he, I mean, he's the one forcing it upon them. But uh, I want something that has to do with like, like our modern day technology, like the way that we're so addicted to like our phones mm-hmm. and our computers and whatnot. And I have no idea like how that's gonna work out. But there's got to be you know mm-hmm. something. I'm and then I'll, I'll, I mean, obviously like the whole. Inter- invading into your nightmares and whatnot like that's so classic i don't mm. know how you top that yeah Broke up. well it's tough right because we're in a society now where we kind of embrace horror whereas in the past we were we would like we would go to these see these movies to purposely get scared because of how scary the world actually was mm-hmm. like a nuclear war was a real thing in the 80s so horror really blew up in the 80s because of that concept of it being right around the corner any kind of number of things so people were kind of sort of fascinated now we're so we're a step ahead we do it where there's so much of it the, the market is so much flooded with horror that really would take a, a, a Herculean effort to create this incredibly uh, intelligent villain horror person horror thing that also touched you viscerally as an audience mm-hmm. you know across mm-hmm. pop culture stream it would be really surprising if they could do that I don't know how you do it maybe you're right maybe it's that kind of thing it's cellular maybe it's AI maybe it's any number Ooh, of things it's definitely yeah an AI. I mean like with Hal is still a resonant a resonating thing to watch in 2001 it still scares the hell out of you mm-hmm. that a computer can actually put you in a box and you have no, nothing there's nothing you can do about it so if you had something like that where AI was achieved that could be incredibly difficult to fight back against. I think you're right in terms of the market being oversaturated but also what's kind of cool about what you're saying is that at that 
because I was a huge horror fan as a kid, mm. and I love Friday the Thirteenth, The Nightmare yeah. on Elm Street, and all of it, and I love those iconic villains. Michael Myers is still such the look of him. Yeah. But what was cool about somebody like Michael Myers is that the fear was both was known because it was Michael, but you didn't know why he was doing mm-hmm. it. And so I feel like that probably felt like nuclear war. Like, why are we doing this crazy yeah, thing? Yeah. Right? But we know we're doing it. And now the fears are so spread out. Right. We don't know. We don't even know what to be afraid of anymore because we're hit with it every day. Yeah. So all the news is uh, like everything yeah. to possibly scare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the real, real lives were scary. Yeah. <laughs> Cody's staring at us with such anger. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> He's such a horror guy. He knows what's really sad. All right. Uh, what's next? <laughs> All right, David Gambino says, with the biopic slash spy version of Stanley's life and development, will they hint at him being the Watcher? Will they what? Hint at him being the Watcher. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, it seems interesting that they're taking his biopic. I I actually personally would have liked (laughs) to seen a a standard biopic about his life, but they're turning into some sort of action spy thriller thing, which I'm fine with. But uh, yeah, I I don't think he's going to they're going to hint at anything like that. Uh, I'm not surprised by it. Stan Lee's got an ego. So this is a good way of him to, he puts himself in his movies for some, for the, for that reason. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with it. That sometimes that's how you succeed in life. So this makes sense for how he's built to do a biopic in this way. So who goes, they could turn him into the watcher. I would be surprised if they, if they went that far, but the fact that they're even coming close to it by doing what they're doing now with the material lets you know, it's certainly a possibility. Yeah. Uh, it probably not. I have you know, echo what you guys said. And yeah. I mean, that movie sounds awesome. I agree with you, Dennis. Like I would love to just see just a straight up yeah. biopic, but I mean, we still could see that. Like that still could happen. Yeah. Probably going to take more time now. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you guys have kind of said it all. Yeah. All right. (laughs) Jonathan Peck says, are you guys doing a commentary one of the Harry Potter movies prior to Fantastic Beasts coming out? Ooh. Uh, I don't know. I mean. What do you mean? I work in the park. I feel like I should. I'm just trying to say, (laughs) which one would we do, though? Because, I mean. (laughs) Well, Azkaban, you have to do. Well, Azkaban is my favorite one. Mm. That's right. It's pretty much everyone's favorite one. So good. First two put me to sleep, so. (laughs) Yeah, first two do. Yeah, Yeah, boy. Um, But, yeah, where do you go with Fantastic? Because it's a spinoff. It's not, you're not leading up to it. So what would we do? And then you have the last two parts of Deathly Potter, Hallows, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I'm trying to think, and yeah, we can't do. Was it nine movies? How many it was movies? Seven movies. There's you seven, seven eight movies. Eight yeah. movies. Oh, it was eight? Yeah. So like, I don't think we can do commentaries for all of them, but I think they split the last yes. two and the two. I re- yeah. correct. I'm the biggest Harry Potter. I just you too. Fail. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe we'll do Azkaban. I mean, maybe we'll throw out a poll and see what what the fans want to do. Right. Yeah, there and which one they want us to do a commentary. Can't on. you do all mm-hmm. fourteen? You could do fourteen hours of magic. Yeah, just okay. just do a whole day. I mean, come yeah. on, it's so easy, right? <laughs> Cody's down. Cody's down. I'm in. Cody, tag me in. Cody, if you if you if you're willing to come and fly here, when we do the commentary. We'll, we'll do we'll do all all eight films. Boom. Yeah. yeah. You guys can take turns watching with me. It'll yeah. be cool. <laughs> all right. What's next? Phil Fan Foom says, "Do you think Power Rangers run the risk of taking itself too seriously?" Uh, I hope not, because uh, that's always a danger, and that's mm. you know my main beef with these Transformer <laughs> films. Oh Jesus! <laughs> yeah, no, well, honestly, do you think they take themselves seriously? Yes, I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Pacific Rim took itself seriously. No, Pacific Rim. You don't see no speech in Transformers oh going, "We're God. gonna save the planet." <laughs> Pacific <laughs> Rim. That. that scene where he they go through, and he punches through the building, and goes mm-hmm. right up to the the little. Uh, what you call it? Mm-hmm. Uh, the little metal balls or whatever. It doesn't take it itself seriously. It. Transformers <laughs> takes itself seriously. What? You, yeah. Oh. This is a yeah. movie fight like yeah. waiting yeah. to Razor. happen. Yeah. It doesn't make any do sense it. to you. Um, feel that way. You judge. Back to, <laughs> back to Power Rangers. Yeah, you're back to Power Rangers. Uh, there is that danger. I, I hope it doesn't. I hope it, it has a sense of fun to it. Uh, while having some, some cool action, I'm not saying to- totally be silly, but at the same time, don't... You know, don't be like, okay, it's like a heavy, heavy film. Yeah. You know, what, what do you guys think? I think it's going to ride the line. I honestly do. I think because if you look at the casting, even if you look at sort of the materials that are coming out, I really think they're going to find the right balance between being fun and capturing the essence of that original tone, but not being maybe as mm-hmm. campy mm-hmm, mm-hmm. as what was happening there. Yeah. I totally agree. Um, I mean, the posters are awesome. But they also say go go on. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I think they're gonna ride that fine line. I think it'll be I'm optimistic about it. Wendy, what do you think? Do you think the the Power Rangers movie is gonna take itself too seriously? I don't think so. Like Cody said, the poster says go go. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, Shanane, what about you? I mean, I think it definitely runs the risk of taking itself too seriously. It could, but I also don't think so. I think they know 
that especially coming from that time period in the 90s everything was super campy and like they have to kind of stick to that to make this work especially for the people like me who were huge Power Rangers fans all right, uh, let's do one more. Yo. All right, this last one goes to Cody, and it's from Derek Spicer. And he says, Cody, would you rather cameo in Aquaman or the next Harry Potter spinoff? Oh! oh this guy is awesome. Oh, his choice. Wow. wow. Oh. oh, that's hard. <laughs> that's like, that's hard. No. If I had to choose one, like no other choice, it would probably be Fantastic Beasts. Mm. I am that much like I mean my my fiance and I we took Harry Potter engagement photos guys like, we're, <laughs> we're really into it and I know I'm an Olympic swimmer and I mean I I love Aquaman so much like Jason Momoa I said earlier I want to hang out with that guy he seems cool dad that's so hard oh. why would you do that to me yeah. oh man what about you guys uh Harry Potter obviously <laughs> <laughs> there's no question no uh, question for me I, I, for me it would be Aquaman <laughs> I, I like Harry Potter I enjoy the franchise I, I just don't have the affinity that, that, that other people at this table do yeah. have for it so Aquaman why do you hate me. Harry Potter <laughs> yeah, <dude. laughs> apparently apparently yeah dude yeah. I, I, I hate little kids with glasses <laughs> oh. Oh. I have all the books I carry a time I reread them I have the time turning I can't believe I had a brain fart about the movies but I love the movies have time turning in my bag I have two wands been to the parks several times talk to my boyfriend though he won't come with me how did you get your fiance on board is it just natural power of love yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah. yeah. eternal sunshine yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right on that note uh that's the end of the show i want to thank the people join us at the table today uh roca where can people find you now wait a minute dennis <laughs> now wait a damn minute have we talked about the schmodown yet that's happening today the ultimate schmodown i am taking a Mark, riley where are you riley what? are you in the room yeah. You're going down, Riley. <laughs> I'm taking you out once and for all. I want that belt. I've been saying it for weeks. I've been recovering my myself since Bestman. I've beaten Mance, beaten Makuga, beaten Christian Harlow with the highest score ever in the Ultimate Showdown. And now I face my greatest challenge yet. The has been Mark Riley, the former <laughs> champion. The former champion. Did you see him lose on Tuesday? There's no steel left. Wow. He's not the man of steel anymore. He's the man of of aluminum foil. And I'm gonna take him out, and I'm gonna go through him. Hey, I'm sorry, Mark, are you in the room still? I'm not gonna yeah. take him out, and I'm gonna take him out, and then I'm gonna take on baby carrots, and I'm gonna put him in a nice dicer and shredder. I'll put him in the blender, and me a nice carrot juice before I face what? Dan Merle, 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 whatever his name is, for the title, because I want Merle. that belt to on my waist. And I'm coming for you. Watch it today, 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, on the Collider Schmozno channel. <laughs> yes, uh, that'll be up 2 p.m., the semifinal for the Schmodown movie tournament uh <laughs> roth where can people find you people can find me at screen junkies um we are launching a new channel soon there's gonna be lots more to come about that screen junkies news there was a brief announcement previously because we had a big casting call dan merle i would i think you're great i wouldn't sleep on dan he's pretty fierce i've gone against him but he's scary and really <laughs> yeah, good and yes. crazy knowledgeable you can also find me pitching my John Wick TV series that takes place in the hotel starring Lance Reddick. Oh, nice. Wow. <laughs> All right. And Cody, uh, yeah. where can people find you? Thanks for having me on again, guys. No, Appreciate thanks it. For this being a blast. Here. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> thanks. You guys can find me at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, just at Cody Miller. And um, thanks, guys. <laughs> uh, Wendy, where can people find you? You can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and also on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And Sinead? I'm online at Sinead DeFries at that's so Sinead.com here on Mondays hosting Collider TV Talk, on Fridays hosting Collider Movie Talk, and hosting Mailbag over the weekends. And you guys can find me on Twitter at Think Hero or Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. Don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com slash Collider Videos. And we will see you guys next time. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.